G'day, welcome to our first and only lesson in our next unit looking at carboxylic acids and their derivatives. Today's lesson, we're going to look at carboxylic acids and esters, where we're going to investigate carboxylic acids, understand the characteristic reactions, and describe the acid base hydrolysis of esters. So carboxylic acids, the final homologous series we're going to look at, they are a class of molecule that have a carboxyl group. So we have a carbon, we have the carbonyl, it also has the hydroxyl, we have the rest of the molecule, and this makes a carboxyl, carbonyl hydroxyl, boom, smash them together, you've got a carboxylic acid. <laughs> now, carboxylic acids. When we are naming carboxylic acids, we don't have to number the chain that the number the carbon that they're on. They're always considered to be carbon number one of the chain. So we name the appropriate carbon suffix and then end it in oic acid. For example, propanoic acid would look like this. I'd have one, two, three carbons, prop, carboxylic acid, propanoic acid. You don't have to say one propanoic acid because by convention, they're always on carbon number one. So just propanoic acid for that one there. Carboxylic acids are acids. Who would have thought it? But they are weak acids. So unlike our strong acids, you know, a lot of our inorganic acids are strong, where they completely dissociate in water, they will all donate the hydrogen, because we know an acid as a Bronsted-Lowry uh, Bronsted definition as a proton donor. Our carboxylic acids as weak acids, only a small amount of them will actually ionize and be able to donate that proton. If I were to draw an equation to represent this, let's consider something like HCl, a strong acid. In HCl, we have all of the acid dissociating, donating the protons, and we end up with the conjugate base like that. Conversely, in our weak organic acids, um, this pen's gonna operate. Let's say we've got something like methanoic acid here. Uh, we don't have it all uh, dissociating. We have an equilibrium that sets up and only a small amount of the acid actually donates the proton to form the conjugate base. Most of it stays in the molecular form. So you can imagine the equilibrium lying very much to the left-hand side. So, you know, we could have equilibrium arrows sort of showing that to show that we have a lot more of the molecular form compared to the ionic form. However, they are still acids. And as acids, they're going to undergo any sort of reaction that an acid does, some which we've seen before. We'll recap that later today. Now, this conjugate base that it forms has the name a carboxylate ion. So we have the carboxylic acid that has the conjugate base when it donates the proton of the carboxylate ion. So if this was going to be called methanoic acid, this would be a methanoate ion. And we can show the formation of that with our proton donating. However, just recall that it's in an equilibrium because it's a weak acid, mostly staying in the molecular form there. Let's discuss the synthesis of carboxylic acids. We've covered this in a few lessons now, actually. Back when we we're looking at the alcohols, we saw how to oxidize through to a carboxylic acid. And then in the most recent lesson, we saw the oxidation of aldehydes can be um, undertaken to get the carboxylic acid. So from a primary alcohol, we can oxidize all the way through to the corresponding carboxylic acid. Let's recap that. We need to warm it first with a oxidizing agent, acidified potassium dichromate, we recognize as the oxidizing agent. It itself is reduced. So we have the primary alcohol. If I were to draw this out here, let's start with our carbon chain. And then we have our primary alcohol can be oxidized to the aldehyde. So if I draw the aldehyde here, Oh my goodness, this pen. There we go. Like that, like that. Uh, you can think of oxidation as the removal of hydrogen. So this is under mild conditions. And then we get H2O. And then what we can do is we can oxidize the aldehyde even further under harsher conditions with um, reflux and excess of our oxidizing agent. And we will form the corresponding carboxylic acid like so so whatever we have 
as our original primary alcohol, that'll be the same carbon chain in that corresponding carboxylic acid. So if we look at that here with some structural formulas. Potassium dichromate as an oxidizing agent, remember we observe a color change when the oxidation occurs, form the aldehyde first of all, and then further oxidation with excess acidified di dichromate under reflux converts the aldehyde through to the carboxylic acid like so. Something we haven't seen before is synthesizing carboxylic acids from nitriles. Recall that nitriles are a class of compound that has a C triple bonded to a nitrogen, a carbon triple bonded to a nitrogen. We can have acid hydrolysis that will occur when refluxing a nitrile with dilute hydrochloric acid, converting the nitrile into the carboxylic acid. So we have the RC triple bond N. I'll just draw that little bit out here. So we would have the nitrile whatever the molecule chain is, C, N, that is the nitrile group, or the C, N is the nitrile group more specifically. So acid hydrolysis, hydrolysis is breaking down with water, acid is acid. So we have HCl, um, H2O, and we form the carboxylic acid, and then a ammonium salt from the uh, acid there. So that's where that nitrogen is going to. Why don't you give that a go using that general equation and using what we know about the structure of butane nitrile, butamine and four carbons. Can you write an equation to show the acid hydrolysis of butane nitrile into its corresponding carboxylic acid? Pause that one, give it a go and check it now. So butane nitrile, we've got our one, two, three, four carbons and our nitrile group. And then we just do the same equation up here. Hydrolysis two, molar equivalents of water with the acid because it's the acid hydrolysis we convert to the corresponding carboxylic acid, which is gonna be butanoic acid, and then the ammonium chloride there as well. Excellent. We understand oxidation as the, in an organic context, um, as adding oxygen atoms or removing hydrogen atoms. And we can understand reduction as essentially the opposite of that, the reversal of that, where reduction is either removing oxygen atoms or adding hydrogen atoms. So we just saw how we can oxidize from the primary alcohol into the corresponding carboxylic acid. What we can do is we can reduce from the carboxylic acid back into the corresponding alcohol. In the same way we use an oxidizing agent to oxidize it, we're gonna use a reducing agent to reduce it. Let's have a look at that now. Reduction to alcohols. So as the oxidation of a primary alcohol can form the corresponding carboxylic acid, therefore the reduction of a carboxylic acid will produce the corresponding primary alcohol. And we use a reducing agent we've seen before called lithium tetrahydridoaluminate. So as with potassium dichromate, acidified potassium dichromate as an oxidizing agent, we need to be able to recognize lithium tetrahydridoaluminate as our reducing agent. Because then, when we have our reaction, the same way we do bracket O for the oxidation, we do a bracket H for the reduction. So the skill is recognizing what your oxidizing agent is and what your reducing agent is. And we use this reducing agent in dry ether because it's very reactive and it will react vigorously if we use it in water. So quite simply, we just have the carboxylic acid, we add four molar equivalents of the reducing agent, and we convert back to the corresponding primary alcohol and then water. So notice here that we're adding one, two, three hydrogens to the, no, sorry, we're adding two hydrogens onto the original carboxylic acid molecule and then two hydrogens on the water byproduct. So therefore the four equivalents are needed. Why don't you use that general equation and see if you can puzzle out what the reduction of propanoic acid would be to propanol. How might you write an equation for that? Pause and check. I'll write this one up on the board so we can go through it together. So quite simply, we have propanoic acid. In fact, I might do a skeletal. One, two, three carbons. Propanoic acid like that. We add the reducing agent, which is our lithium tetrahydridoaluminate, four molar equivalents, and we convert it back to the corresponding uh, alcohol. And then, water as the byproduct. So you can see we're adding a hydrogen onto the carbon there, uh, two hydrogens onto the carbon there rather, and then two hydrogens on the water. So we are reducing it. If we were to write that with structural formulas, we would see this as an answer. 
Propanoic acid, back to propan 1 -ol. So just remember, we don't have to specify the carbon of the propanoic acid, but we do have to specify the carbon of the alcohol if there are potential isomers that can form. Now, like I said right at the start, carboxylic acids are acids. So they're gonna undergo any reaction that an acid does. For example, acid plus metal, acid plus base, acid plus a metal carbonate. And then what they're gonna do is they're gonna form salts, so an ionic salt between a cation and an anion, but our anion is going to be our carboxylate ion, so that polyatomic carboxylate ion with a negative charge on that oxygen. Now, we talked about the strength of the acid, saying they won't dissociate completely when added to water. Only a small amount of the carboxylic acid will dissociate to lose H plus and form the conjugate base. So as weak acids, we would see a pH less than seven, because that's what the acidic region of the pH scale is. But being a weak acid, they will fall just below seven. So in that weak region, you know, six, five around there. Compared to our strong acids, which will be all the way down at one, two. But they will still undergo these characteristic reactions that we've seen before. Acid plus base goes to salt plus water. Acid plus metal goes to salt plus hydrogen gas. Acid plus metal carbonate goes to salt, water, and carbon dioxide. The anion in the salt is the carboxylate ion. So if I do one example here, I won't do all the examples because I'll get you to do that in just a second and we'll go through some answers. But let's say if we had calcium propanoate. So let's say we did a reaction which was acid plus a metal. So acid plus metal goes to the salt plus uh, hydrogen gas. So <laughs> my acid is going to be the propanoic acid. CH3, CH2, C, I might write this out like that so we can see what's going on with the structure here. Uh, the metal, let's say we react that with calcium metal. So what we do is we form the ionic salt between the calcium, so the calcium is gonna make a two plus ion, and then our carboxylic acid makes the corresponding carboxylate where it's gonna lose the hydrogen and make a carboxylate ion like that. So the salt with the CO2 plus and the one minus carboxylate, we need two of them for one of them. So it's the same as any other salt between a cation and an anion. Our anions are just these polyatomic carboxylates. So I could write this as Ca and then CH3, CH2, COO, two of them. You can put the charges in if you want, two plus minus one, up to you, you don't have to, but you can. And then we would have our hydrogen as our byproduct. And we would need two of those to balance that there like that. All right, why don't you give it a go? I've got the general equations here. Can you, for ethanoic acid, write an equation to represent the following with a sodium substance? So our acid in all three cases, if we've got acid plus a metal, it's gonna be ethanoic acid plus sodium, acid plus a base, ethanoic acid plus sodium hydroxide, and finally, ethanoic acid and sodium carbonate. Pause, write an equation to represent that. Remember the carboxylate anion, will go with the sodium cation to form the salt, and we will end up with these answers. So our ethanoic acid is gonna react with sodium to form the sodium ethanoate and hydrogen gas. So just following that general equation there. Acid plus base is gonna to go to the salt plus water. So the same sort of thing, only we've got the water because it's a base and then to balance it, we balance it a little bit differently. So remember, they're all, all gonna be balanced as any chemical equation does. And then finally, our sodium carbonate, we've got our ethanoic acid plus sodium carbonate goes to sodium ethanoate, water, and carbon dioxide. So when the acid reacts, it forms the conjugate base, which is gonna be the anion and the salt, and we just call that whatever the carboxylate salt is gonna be. So if we've got Methanoic acid, that makes methanoate. So if we have magnesium methanoate, or potassium methanoate, or propanoate, or butanoate, or pentanoate, magnesium pentanoate, so on and so forth. Just like any other acid base, acid salt, uh, sorry, acid base, acid metal, acid metal carbonate reaction would. To finish off today, we're going to go back over the esters briefly. We introduced the ester a while back in our alcohol um, lessons because we can have an esterification reaction where we make an ester because that's the reaction between an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. So we're going to go back over that now very briefly. 
Um, and we will also look at some of the chemical properties of the ester in a bit more detail. So if I have an alcohol, whatever that alcohol is gonna be, and I have a carboxylic acid, in fact, what I might do is I might write my carboxylic acid on this side, like that. And then I have the alcohol, we get an esterification reaction where we lose water, so H2O, and we form the new bond, and we form the ester linkage, which looks like that. I'll do a little dash there to specify that they're different. So this is the ester. We can do the esterification, lose water, write it above the arrow, or you can put it in as the byproduct over there. And that's what I've got there. In order to do this reaction, we need to reflux it with an acid catalyst. And we talked about the uses of esters. Um, they're most known for their very fruity and characteristic smells. So they're used in perfumes and flavorings and cosmetics. But then they can also be used to make polyesters in the synthesis of plastics, used as solvents, whole myriad of uses we can use them for. So once we've got the ester, what you might notice here is we have a reversible reaction. So this reaction go in the forward direction. However, it can also go, oh, I should have done that as a equilibrium arrow there, because it's that equilibrium. So we can go in the forward reaction, but we can also go in the backward reaction here. So if we consider this, we can get the ester, we can react with water, and then we can break it back down into the carboxylic acid and the alcohol. So this is gonna be a hydrolysis reaction because if we look at this backward reaction, we're breaking the ester down with water. That's what hydrolysis means. And there's two ways we can do this. We can either have, oh, we require the reflux to supply that heat without losing the volatile organic compounds. And then we can either do an acid hydrolysis or a base hydrolysis. Let's start first with the acid hydrolysis. In the case of the acid hydrolysis, it will just reverse the above reaction exactly the same way that we saw over here. So if we have an acid hydrolysis, I'll make this consistent with my equilibrium arrow, then we're just gonna form whatever the corresponding carboxylic acid is and whatever the corresponding alcohol is. Uh, what does this say? The ester will break down into the corresponding alcohol and carboxylic acid, but it will result in a mixture of both the reactants and products. So you'll end up with everything in there at the end. The reaction won't go to completion. Using this equation up here, considering the backwards reaction, can you write an equation to show the acid hydrolysis of ethyl ethanoate? Pause, do that, check the answer when you're done. So in the case of the ethyl ethanoate, so when we're naming esters, we name the uh, alcohol part first. So the ethyl, I'll go H, actually, let me, we'll do this a bit different. I'll go CH3, CH2, and then we'll have our oxygen there like that, so that's the ethyl part. And then we name the carboxylic acid part, so the ethyl ethanoate is going to have two carbons there. Like so. Then we are reacting with water, so I'm gonna have plus H2O, and then we have an equilibrium. Very important to include the equilibrium here, uh, arrow here, because we said that the reaction will not go to completion, we'll end up with a mixture of both the reactants and the products. So what you can imagine here, if we've got an acid catalyst, we're going to sever the ester linkage, we're gonna pop a hydrogen back on there, we're gonna pop a hydroxyl back on there, and we're going to end up with the corresponding acid and alcohol. So our corresponding alcohol is ethanol, and our corresponding carboxylic acid, whoops, what's going on there? <laughs> there we go is going to be ethanoic acid, CH3COOH, like that. So quite simply, we are just reversing the reaction. Now that's if it's acid hydrolysis. It's a little bit different if we have base hydrolysis. In the case of base slash alkali hydrolysis, what happens is we need to reflux an ester with an alkali However, this is not a reversible reaction. So this reaction will go to completion. So unlike the acid hydrolysis, where we end up with a mixture of reactants and products, base hydrolysis will react to all of the reactants and will just end up with the products, which will be the corresponding alcohol and the corresponding carboxylate salt. 
because we're in alkali conditions, we're not going to form the carboxylic acid because that's an acid and acids can react with bases. So if we're in alkali conditions, the carboxylic acid is going to be deprotonated. So we'll end up with the conjugate base as the salt. Have a go at writing an equation showing the base hydrolysis of ethyl ethanoate, considering what I've just told you there. Pause, see if you can work out what the answer would be, and then check it when we resume here. So we've got the same, uh, same ester to start off with, which I'll draw slightly differently this time. Be the same thing. Uh, let's go C, and then O, and then we'll have CH2, and then CH3, like that. Then we are doing the alkali, the base hydrolysis. So that's with sodium hydroxide. Now this is not the reversible reaction. This reaction goes to completion. So I got a full arrow. And what we said is we form the corresponding alcohol and then the corresponding carboxylate salt. So same thing, if we break that ester linkage, we're gonna end up with the corresponding alcohol, which will be the ethanol, CH3, CH2OH. But this time, we won't end up with the corresponding carboxylic acid because we're in alkali conditions. Rather, we'll end up with sodium ethanoate. So O minus like that, and then Na plus like that. So this is the alkali hydrolysis. We still break down the ester, but we form the carboxylate salt instead of the uh, carboxylic acid as the molecule. So important to know the differences between that, especially between how far the reaction goes to completion. The acid hydrolysis remains at equilibrium, whereas the base hydrolysis, will the reaction will go all the way to completion. And that concludes our short little look at the carboxylic acids. What have we done? We described the formation of carboxylic acids from alcohols, aldehydes, and nitriles. Described the reaction of carboxylic acids in the formation of salts by the use of reactive metals, alkalis or carbonates, alkyl esters, and then alcohols with our reducing agent. Finally, we describe the acid and base hydrolysis of esters, state the major commercial uses of esters. We covered that as well. Here are the tasks for the lesson. You know what to do, pause, work through, and you are golden. Thank you for your time as always. One and only lesson for this unit. We'll move on to our next and final unit in the next video. Have a great day and see you then.